Okay, uh, we'll make a start then. Well, so welcome to this session, uh, which we've titled Do Not Make It New, which is a modernism pun, on reusing research software and tools in digital humanities scholarship. Uh, I'm Emily Bell. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in the School of English at the University of Leeds, and I've organised this session with Anna Maria Sishani, who is a postdoctoral research fellow in media history and historical data modelling at the University of Sussex and Sussex Humanity La Humanities Lab. So the aim of this session is to begin a conversation about reusing software in digital humanities scholarship. We're planning some longer workshops for the autumn. So this is a kind of opening provocation. Um, we're aware it's a very short session. Uh, so the collaborative notes document, please use it to introduce yourself, bright questions for the speakers, which we'll definitely pick up in later workshops if we don't get around to all of them today. And please add any resources or links or comments that might be helpful. We're really grateful for the input of all of you as participants and people interested in this area. So there's some headings there, such as funding opportunities you might be aware of, resources for developing new project or for encouraging software reuse, and there's a general section. So add comments or questions or resources or anything. So we've got three wonderful speakers coming up and I'm gonna hand over to Anna Maria to introduce our first speaker. Thanks. Um, thanks, Emily. Um, hello also uh, from me. Uh, we're very, very happy uh, uh, to uh, co-organizing this session at the collaborative workshop at, of the Software Sustainability Institute. We're very grateful also for hosting, um, you know, we're very grateful to the Institute for allowing us uh, hosting this workshop. And I'm going to um, I'm going to start uh, with our first speaker, Melody Bills as a lecturer in digital history in the School of Social Sciences and Humanities at the Lowbrow University. Her research explores the, way as, the ways in which the movement of peoples and ideas intersect and the practical traces of imagined communities within the Anglophone world. Um, as an advocate of the digital humanities and open research, uh, she works to develop and promote computer-aided methodologies um, through her roles as history editor of the Open Library of the Humanities and fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute. Melody, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about reuse in the humanities in terms of, of software after the fact. So after you've already created your software and you decide, hey, maybe this should be reusable as opposed to just existing within my own project, how do you kind of retroactively do that? So I think the first thing I really want to put across is that I am actually a very big advocate for developing bespoke software. There is a really big temptation to always develop software that you know is going to be reusable. It's going to solve all the problems in your field or across humanities. Everyone's going to love it and it's going to make me a fortune in some kind of spin out. Those are really noble goals and I do not discourage anyone from them, but I think maybe a slightly more reflective way of looking at software sustainability is to really understand what the software is needed for and it's usually needed for your own project. So um, I really do advocate developing software as you're going along with your project to solve the problems that you're actually facing. And one of the things that I also really advocate is that humanity scholars should learn to program, um, not just hack together or um, cut and paste other people's code, although that's a fine way to start, but um, learning how to program because you as a historian or a literature scholar or a linguist know the problem that is facing you and you understand why software has not solved this problem. So just really briefly, some of the bespoke software that I made for really simple projects, I made a program called quote PDF, which its entire purpose was when I copy and pasted from PDFs to do long quotations, all the line breaks were messed up and it was annoying me so, so much that I just created a really simple program that automatically removed all the line breaks and made my quotes all nice and pretty. I did put this up and I know a couple people downloaded it to, to use for their research, but it didn't matter to me because it solved my problem and at least I put it out there for people if they had the same problem. 
I also tried to develop visualization software for a particular article I was writing on newspaper layouts. I actually did it in collaboration workshop 2018, I think, in the, um, the back of the auditorium in between various sessions with a couple of lovely mathematician fellows. Um, and I also created Nisaba, which was just a way that I could annotate my research um, that no other annotation program would do. And what I found out is the best way to get people to use your research, your um, research software, is just to let them see it in action. So I can go around to lots of places and say, I've created this fantastic piece of software, use it, it's great. And nobody is going to because people are generally speaking quite conservative. They use Word, they use Excel, they might use OpenRefine if people have badgered them enough about it to use it instead of just Excel. But you really have to show people that it is making a, a definite um, solution to problems that exist in your field. Um, it's not just a toy or a tool that would be really neat if people used it. So when I wrote my article, um, for the Victorian Periodical Review, I made sure to include not just the visualizations that my program had created, but really detailed explanation of how the program worked and links to the software kind of already compiled up, as well as the code, as well as lots of examples of how it worked. And in fact, it has been used by two other people now um, who just found it because they read my article and then explored it a little bit more. I didn't have to do any kind of um, personal advocacy. So make sure that if the software works for you and it's bespoke, you actually explain that in your research so people say, oh yeah, that solves my problem as well. The other way I found really that helped is just doing it through teaching. So um, I gave quite a lot of talks to dissertation students and postgrad students at my university um, about the research I was doing, so essentially conference papers. And they said, oh, how did you get this to work like this? I said, oh, well, I developed this little bit of software. And then suddenly I had you know, three or four PhD students in other departments come to see me in my office and see if we could collaborate to make the software fix their bespoke problems as opposed to just my bespoke problems. So that was really fun. Uh, you know, it was like an afternoon of extra work for three or four times where they said, I like your software. It does all the things I need for my research, but could it do this one extra thing? And we spent a couple hours and hammered it out. And now Nisaba, which is the software I generally speaking use for my own encoding of my text, now has all these extra little features that people in English or media and communication or social science said, this would be great if it just did this one extra thing. And I've actually used those bits and pieces in my own research now because I had never thought about having those features. Um, but I, in the end, I'm kind of humble about it. I put it up on GitHub. I tried to document it as best I can. But in the end, I let these things happen organically. If somebody gets inspired by my research and improves it or they just use part of it, I'm super happy. It's really just about making the research solve the problem that's at hand and not worrying too much about competing with Microsoft or you know, Zoom or any other existing corporation. It's about solving the problem that you as a disciplinarian know is the problem in your discipline. And I will stop there and hand it over. Super. Uh, many thanks, Melody, for this uh, really fascinating, quick, quick intervention. Um, and we're now moving to uh, Professor Tim Hitchcock. Um, he is a professor of digital history at the University of Sussex. And until um, this month, I guess, uh, he was a director of the Sussex Humanities Lab. Over the last 35 years, uh, he has led a dozen projects to post and analyze data uh, contributing to a new history uh, from below. Uh, these sites um, include the Old Bailey Online, London Lives, and the Digital Panopticon. Tim, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. And I'm afraid I probably have misinterpreted the, uh, the, the audience and the, and the purpose, because I really want to say a little bit about um, data um, rather than software. But I think that the overall point I want to make is equally valid, that actually most of this stuff is highly political and we don't engage enough with the politics of it. 
Now, before the World Wide Web, and this goes back a little ways, in the 90s, I spent two years creating a relational database in a package that no one here will have ever heard of. It was a great database that ran to around 10,000 lines of data, and I wrote an article that I still quite like on the basis of it. I then promptly lost the password. The data still sits on my hard drive 30 years later, inaccessible and growing in my mind's eye into an ever more perfect resource and data set. But, that I, but I very much suspect that if I was to miraculously recover that data, I would be hugely disappointed. And that's really the nub of what I wanna to say today. Old data, other people's programs, other people's data, and all the systems that we've developed in, the, um, in order to work particularly with the debt are generally a bit rubbish. And unless we build that truth, that recognition of the rubbishness, the extent to which most of the packages we use come from other fields or for design for different purposes and embed their own kind of intellectual politics, we'll just get it wrong. Now, since that early foray into the creation of data, I've incorporated dozens of other people's data sets and used um, a lot of different packages. I don't, I, I don't write, write code and I don't develop um, software. But in that process, what has, what has emerged is that you know, trying to meld a large number of different types of data actually builds a series of problems that we aren't yet confronting. Now, most recently in the Digital Panopticon project, we had some 50 different data sets from at least eight different repositories, all brought together onto a single site that supposedly allows data to be reorganized around historical individuals. In that instance, people transported to Australia during the 19th century. And this included you know, data from commercial um, repositories like Ancestry and Find My Past, academic data from areas like groups, places like Zenodo, and from the UK data archive and also crowdsourced data from a dozen public um, history initiatives, all of which had their own individual problems and none of which were um, entirely consistent. And in all those instances, the real problem for reuse is and was that the systems we create have no consistent relationship to the object of study. A bad OCR of a 19th century newspaper, excuse me, Melody, um, is not a newspaper. It is barely data. A structured data set created from a historical time series will push the original back and forth and force it remor remorselessly into a series of cells. Either the data was originally forced into a tabular form by some 19th century civil servant, or we're doing just the same kind of process ourselves. But in either case, the relationship between the data that we work with and how we work with it and the knowledge it purports to represent is problematic and profoundly political. So in terms of reuse of other people's stuff or even reuse of your own, I think the first thing we need to think about is to acknowledge that in turning one type of object into another, we're doing damage to it and misrepresenting it along the way. In generating data and using it in particular packages, we are creating a selective politically charged object of study. And second, when it comes to reuse, that political character is even more important. Where did the data come from? Whose politics does it represent? And what further damage are you doing to it when you throw a bit of NLP at it? It is all important to know that object first and to be wary of it from the very beginning. And if you're importing somebody else's data, it is important to understand those origins, their prejudices, their assumptions, their purposes. Now, about the same time I was creating that first database, a colleague was busy transcribing voting and taxation records. They created a massive data set designed to prove a very particular point about economics and politics in the 18th century. And that data set is now available on the web and is used happily by hundreds of people a month. But because the original purpose of the data's collection was to measure voting behavior, and because women did not have the vote, they excluded all data about women from their data set of taxation fundamentally misrepresenting the economics of the period and, mis and misleading endless generations of scholars since. Unless it seems to me you're willing to work to turn old data and other people's software into something you absolutely understand from beginning to end, 
and to recreate it in a new image. Much of what we'll be doing is simply embedding prejudice and failure into the final analysis. Thanks. Great, many thanks team for this. Uh, so we're now gonna move to the last uh, speaker, uh, which is uh, Matteo Romanello. Uh, Matteo, um, he's a lecturer at the University of Lausanne, uh, where he conducts a project on the commentary uh, tradition of Sophocles Ajax. Uh, Matteo is a classicist and a digital humanities specialist uh, with expertise in various areas of the humanities, including archeology span and history. After updating uh, his PhD from King's College London, he worked as a research scientist at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne uh, lab on the linked books and impressor project before moving to his current position. Um, he was also teaching fellow at the University of Rostock, researcher at the German Archaeological Institute and visiting uh, research scholar at Taft University. Matteo, uh, we're all ears. Thanks very much for the introduction. I hope you can see the slides. I, I'm not seeing the videos, so I'm not. Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, well, I go straight into the, uh, into the topic. And what I love so far is that we, compared to the other two speakers, I had a very different interpretation of the topic of the workshop. So the, while preparing the talk, I've been asking myself about reasons of this issue of creating new software instead of reusing existing ones. Does it just happen to be like that? Or is it some kind of strategy either declared or hidden to cope and deal with some deeper issue? Um, if it's a strategy, I thought, then it's very similar to Pen Penelope's shroud. Penelope, in fact, was undoing every night the work done during the day in a fight to resist various attempts to marry her by a bunch of suitors in the absence of Odysseus, who was still traveling uh, to return to Ithaca. Um, so she had promised to marry one of them when she would have finished the work but she never finished because she was undoing uh, the work every night. So th the conclusion to which I came, kind of a working conclusion, is that the phenomenon we are seeing of reading new software from scratch instead of reusing existing ones seems, in fact, a strategy to cope with a much bigger issue, namely the lack of specific funding dedicated to the maintenance and support of research software, an issue that I think it's very eloquently described in this famous SKCD comic. Um, of course, it's not always an intentional event in the wheel. There are cases where we might need different implementations of different methods and algorithms and written in, in different languages, which may justify having several tools to deal with the same task, like uh, text to use to mention an example that I came across in my own research. But we also find cases um, like in the area of computational literary studies, where several researchers from different European institutions have come together and collaborated to develop a common library called Stylo to avoid duplication of efforts. Um, and lastly, I wanted to mention Inception, which I believe is a good example of how to develop new software in a way that is appealing to funders of grant proposals, but at the same time allows for funding the maintenance of prior software on which the new one has been built upon. So Inception, Inception is a powerful annotation platform built on another tool previously developed by the same team called Webano, which in turn reused the visualization front end of another tool called Brack. And all this together, it's been going on since 2013. Um, I've been also asking myself, what makes a software fit for being reused? Um, and here, are some key criteria, um, I think. So having the resource code released under an open license, of course, uh, thorough technical documentation, as well as software paper or tutorials like those in the programming historian on how to use that tool, um, but also the ability to support a wide number of established formats and use cases. Um, and finally, the existence of a sustainability plan before, because before deciding to reuse and build on another tool or library, I need to make sure that it's reliable and it can, it can be maintained in the, in the near future. Um, and as you will understand, uh, ticking all these boxes in situations where the resources are limited, uh, becomes a problem. And we often find it ourselves, I've been there myself, uh, in the situation of not having time to properly document our code, produce tutorials and the like. And in other words, I think um, creating and maintaining quality research so software, and by quality I mean that is reusable for others without disposing of adequate funding is extremely hard. Um, so we come again to the issue of the lacking of funding 
Of course, it's not a problem exclusively in the humanities. And there is a nature article that appeared less than a week ago, which does a very good job in analyzing the situation and pinning down the problem or naming the beast, uh, to use their own words. And, and I'm reading an excerpt. So to make research software sustainable, we must adapt our credit and reward system and ensure that we treat software as not only something that underpins research, but also as a first class output. It needs to be funded, maintained, and have viable career paths. Even if researchers involved, involved are writing more lines of computer code than lines in an academic manuscript. Uh, so just to conclude, some thoughts uh, on what we could and perhaps should do to work uh, towards more sustainable research software in the humanities. Um, first of all, I think we should work together with colleagues in other disciplines to raise awareness at national funding agencies about this issue. This is something where national and international DH associations, as well as existing digital research infrastructures may help in making the voices of researchers heard. In the meanwhile, and this is not something that we happen quickly, we could explore more existing funding possibilities, even though I'm quite pessimistic about the chances that DH software stands in these codes, which are open to any kind of open source uh, software. Uh, and finally, um, I think we should publish more software papers. Uh, this type of publication is extremely important, yet it's something that we have seen much less often in DH compared, for example, to data papers. And I don't think there is a lack of venues for such articles. Software papers are important for two reasons, I think, because other researchers can cite them when using their software in their research. And in this way, they make it easier for the software creators to document the usage, or we could say the impact of a given piece of software. And also because even assuming that there is funding for the maintenance of resource software, there will be some decisions to be made as to what deserves funding. And on this respect, being able to document traces of software usage in publications uh, can help the funding bodies in deciding what software should be funded and thus preserved. Thank you very much. And thanks to all three of our speakers for quite different approaches, I think, to this question that give us a lot to think about and show us that if we ever thought it was straightforward, it definitely isn't. Um, something that struck me with all three of the presentations is how, how you report on what's happening. So Melody was talking about having a journal article where you, you know, you link to the software and you, you make it clear how, why it was built and the kind of things that go into it. With Tim's data set, there's the idea of our own biases going into it. And Matteo, the, the comment you showed, documentation, I'm working on it. Uh, and this idea that, <laughs> that, we, that we sometimes think of it as an afterthought, but, but with Melodies, it was kind of at the end of the process. With Tim, it was all the way through. And then I, I was wondering if all three of you could speak to this point of, of how do you build that documentation into the process? Um, at the end, at the beginning, in the middle, like how, how do we factor that into the creation of, of something? I, I guess I'll start unless Tim looked like he was about to, to pounce. <laughs> go for it, go for it. I, I guess just, I, I'm really bad about documentation. I'm terrible about it. Um, I do try to document as I go along by putting comments in my code and, and really, um, teleological comments, this section is supposed to do this, it's supposed to create this, um, this is why I'm doing it. So they're quite narrative. Um, I, I had a, a colleague who'd laughed at my code once uh, affectionately saying that it was clearly written by a humanities person because I had these quite discursive comments where I explained what I was trying to do. Um, and I think that's really helpful. I try to keep my, my update log to do the same thing where I explain what each thing is doing. But yeah, I think I think if I actually just made myself and said, I have to say five minutes at the end of every coding session where I actually write up everything that I've just done in kind of user documentation, it would work a lot better. But um, that's that's something that I don't actually do. So I, I that's do as I say, not as I do. Can um, I say, I think that um, Mateo has it really right in many respects that actually the problem is the nature of publication in the humanities as a general thing. Um, and the example that I, I, I'm quite enthusiastic about at the moment is um, Andreas Flicker's uh, new um, Journal of Digital History, which is designed as a kind of three part um, form of publication. So data at one layer, commentary on the other, uh, and reflexive um, statements about process, and then 
commentary or, or academic writing on the top layer. And I just don't think that at the moment, you know, flat articles really do, do justice to the processes involved. Maybe just a very quick comment to say that I've been trying different approaches to documentation in different projects. Um, it always happens a bit too late. So there is a tendency, it's a, I think it's a matter of prioritizing uh, because the research software is not kind of a first class uh, citizen in terms of research output. If we have to decide how to spend time between writing you know, tutorials and documentation and writing an actual research paper, there is a clear choice. So for this reason, I think we tend to write documentation a bit always too late, uh, but I've been trying to improve on that. But I think it's, it's a matter of kind of research priorities that are also dictated by uh, kind of what is recognized as output um, and what counts. Yeah, that's definitely a big issue, I think. Um, there, there's quite a few questions for individual panelists, uh, panelists in, the, in the thing. We're, we're sort of running out of time, so I'm gonna focus on the questions that are for all the panelists. Um, somebody's still typing, but I'm gonna give it a go anyway. They, they say to all panelists, they were hoping that you could mediate on the fact that doing digital research in the humanities now requires massive software infrastructure. And currently we don't disambiguate between software being built as a general knowledge creation infrastructure, like voyant tools versus bespoke projects. Do you feel like this is an obstacle for funding and crediting this kind of labor? And how do we decide when something is general infrastructure versus just for one project? It's a problem. I mean, and there is no easy solution. If you think about the ways in which um, the funding structures work, um, you know, it it absolutely does not create the right um, right context for the funding of bespoke um, development, um, nor does it actually adequately address the issues around infrastructure. I mean, in the UK, just over the last three or four years, GISC has essentially you know, stopped doing any of the hard work that it had, it had done for the previous 20 years in terms of infrastructure. So I, I think we have a fundamental problem and I, I despair, I, I don't despair, but um, I think it, it is, one that for which we don't have an obvious solution. Yeah, I, I would just echo that and say that I actually got to the point um, where I kind of gave up on the idea of getting funding because I didn't want to make a giant program that was going to solve all case studies um, because that was not what my aim was. My aim was to solve a particular problem. And so just trying to fit that into other research calls, give myself a little time to do this sort of thing is the best compromise I've come up with. Um, the point that Matteo made, I thought that I hadn't thought about, but the funding for maintenance, specifically for maintenance, is just something I've never seen and, and would really be wonderful. So yeah, I, I would support it even if I've kind of given up on chasing it myself. Super, many thanks for this. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So apologies for uh, the questions that they've been unanswered, but uh, please uh, speakers feel free to answer them or continue the discussion, carry on the discussion on the actual, uh, on the SIR document. Um, so uh, I would like to thank our three speakers for their um, insights and their, um, their SIR experience and contribution to this uh, session uh, regarding, um, you know, reusing research software in digital humanities. I would like also to thank all the attendees for, um, you know, um, uh, sharing also questions and ideas. Please uh, uh, feel free to continue the discussion on the Google Doc. Uh, where we aim to go from here, we're going to have some speed blog uh, blogging post at uh, SSI, so summarizing the discussion and probably, um, uh, and also feel free to join and you want to contribute also to this blog post. Uh, we are also going to encourage discussion on this issue and uh, that would possibly could save uh, digital humanities funders uh, um, in order to uh, encourage them um, focusing on this uh, specific issues of uh, sustainability of digital uh, humanities software and uh, research software. Uh, stay tuned, as Emily mentioned uh, in the beginning, we are planning a series of workshops uh, on uh, software sustainability practice in the AIDS scholarship. Um, many thanks again uh, for joining and um, have a lovely afternoon.
Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.